Hey guys, welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from sunny California. When I'm not behind the mic, I buy multifamily properties with passive investors who partner with me on my deals. If you're thinking about investing passively in real estate and want to learn how to evaluate a deal, I created a free guide that walks you through the top five critical deal components any passive investor must examine. You can find it on my website, ellieperlman.com. So my guest today is Bob Fraser. Bob has been in real estate and finance for over 20 years now and is the founder and principal of Aspen Funds. Bob focuses his investments on residential mortgage notes and has purchased more than a thousand notes throughout his career. Prior to that, Bob launched a tech company back in the 90s and later transitioned to finance and investing and became the CFO of several organizations and even ran a hedge fund. So Bob is a magna cum laude graduate in computer science from U.S. Berkeley and former Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award winner. Wow, that's a very impressive background, Bob. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Well, welcome. Um, do, do you mind? So obviously you have a very, very impressive uh, background and you're a very established and well-recognized entrepreneur. Can you tell me and the listeners a little bit more about your kind of, you know, your, your background and how you started investing in notes? Sure. Well, you know, it goes way back. I, I, as as the, you read, I was a computer science major from Berkeley. So I, I was Mr. Code. I loved writing code. Right? Nothing is beautiful as a great piece of code. It's like poetry. And um, so there I was in my little cave and uh, got this business idea, talked to mom and convinced mom to, to put some money in. And we started with in my attic with my sister-in-law and uh, about five years later, end up with $44 million in venture capital and, uh, you know, largest venture capitalized business in the Midwest and uh, it's, it's incredible gro growth rates. And then it all got, we got caught in the dot-com wreck and right before our IPO. So end up losing everything. And, uh, but I kind of got, I got what I call a street MBA, you know, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really good, but they're a lot more expensive, you know? <laughs> so, so I, I, I know so what you mean. MBA owner, you know, MBA holder, which is great. I encourage, you know, I encourage all my kids to go get MBAs. And so, so that I really, really was very foundational for me to understand market cycles and understand how to raise money and these kind of things and kind of levered that into CFO work. Uh, for the for a number of nonprofits and other things and then got into real estate after having two encounters with the stock market you know, that where I said you know what I don't want to be in the stock market anymore I don't want to make money in the stock market or have you know stocks I really want something a little more stable and um, and then met my partner who's a real estate guy and he had lost everything in the 2000 you know eight crash and so that's when we decided to get into notes and get on the other side of the equity, right? Where we're, we're the debt holders and uh, because debt holders are obviously, you know, a lot safer and, um, and can weather the storms a little better. So that's kind of my, you know, our entree, I guess, into our real estate, uh, you know, enterprise. Got it. So yeah, let's, let's talk about residential mortgage uh, notes. What are they exactly? Well, when you buy a house, you go and get a loan um, from a bank or some mortgage lender, and then those are packaged up and sold off. Uh, we buy them. So we become the bank. We become your lender. Uh, we buy distressed, distressed notes. So a lot of times these are notes that are, that are, we're not paying for a time and now we're paying are called troubled debt restructures, or we buy various kinds of, uh, you know, seller finance notes and other kinds of things that offer high yields and discounts. Got it. Got it. So it's these are, really these interesting. Are sing, these, these are single family residences. Which we got love. it. So you're basically, you're, you're investing in the note itself. You're, you're what you call the lien lord, right? You're, you're, that's right. We become the bank. We become, become the bank. So all that fine print that the banks have where they don't lose no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, uh, tails I win, heads you lose, you know, that's all ours. We get all that, all that, you know, the, the whole system is, is really very lender friendly, 
generally. And so we become, we buy these notes and we collect payments instead of rent payments, we collect mortgage payments, but very, very similar. It's very different in some ways too, because if, for example, when's the last time you called your bank when your toilet stopped or mm-hmm. when, you know, so we don't get the call. So it's a much more scalable business. Um, and uh, very, very suitable for, for us, you know, these, these hands don't swing hammers. So uh, they wouldn't know what to do with a hammer, I'm afraid, you know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, great with spreadsheets and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, systems. So, so it's really a very scalable business. Got it. Interesting. And you said that the environment was very, um, kind of is very friendly to you as a note holder. What, what yeah. do you mean by that? Well, um, meaning that there's a whole system set up for lenders, right? The banks that, uh, that write you the, these notes, they write, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars in these notes. And there's an, an entire infrastructure around servicing those notes, collecting on those notes, um, you know, just, and, and really the banks don't lose, Okay, that's the point. It's all locked up. The laws, the case laws, everything is locked up so that the banks win. And so when you step in and take over that paper, I inherit all of that infrastructure and all of that legal, uh, you know, contract that you signed. Got it. So if the bank has those infrastructures and, and, you know, processes and protections in place, and you said the bank doesn't lose, why would they sell the note to you then? Yeah, and you know, it's like, it's like uh, you know, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts, fantastic show, you know, you do. And, Thank you. And you know, they don't know what to do with these things, right? They're, they don't know when, when they get a loan that's, that's, that's bad, especially let's call it a second mortgage. And I love seconds. I would rather own a second than a first, which I'll tell you why, but you know, um, they don't know what to do. They, they literally camp. They don't know what to do on it. And ultimately, they let these things get kind of old and stinky, and mm-hmm. then they sell them off. And so you want, once a bank, once a bank, uh, once a loan goes into what's called non-accrual status, which means it's, they no longer can expect the payment stream to come, they must write that note down to a fair market value, which in, in a case of a second mortgage is basically zero. So literally, they have to write it off. And this is banking regulations. This is their capital uh, regulations. They have, they have to maintain certain levels of capital, right, for their asset base. Um, and for to them, an asset is a loan. So, so, uh, so they have to write it off. So it literally sits on their books at zero until, until it gets stinky enough. They say, you know what, let's, uh, let's take out the trash. And even if that borrower starts repaying, so they end up repaying. They, they so they you know get back on their feet. Mostly people want to pay their mortgage, okay? So they get you know they recover from their divorce or they get their job or whatever. They start paying again. That loan remains a troubled debt restructure forever. It is never a good loan ever again to a bank, and they have to reserve extra for that. So it's just it's kind of this black eye, and mm-hmm. ultimately they get where they get rid of it. A lot of these loans are also created by hedge funds that go and buy non-performing loans. So they buy these big pools, billions of dollar pools of non-performing loans and a certain percentage of them, they end up re-performing, meaning get the bars back on track. And then we buy those. Got it. That's very interesting. Um, do you think, so obviously, you know, when we're recording it now, it's, uh, it's May 6th and we're kind of, you know, we've been uh, in quarantine for several months now. How did the whole business of mortgage note buying and, um, and collecting, ha- has it changed in any way since the pandemic started? And how, what are you doing to protect your investments? Yeah, it's probably very similar. I know you're in the multifamily space. It's very similar. I, I, I think... You know, you know, there's basically forbearance happening on, on you know, on, on any notes that are owned by Fannie and Freddie. Now, those aren't ours, but it confuses people. And they say, well, you know, hey, can't I, you know, not don't have to pay my mortgage now. <laughs> and so there's a few people that that are that are super excited about that and, uh, you know, misinformation and try and take advantage. But generally, you know, we're not seeing a ton. We're, you know, we have 
you know, we, we, we maintain around, a, you know, around a five to 10% kind of a, um, a default rate in our funds, which we, we underwrite to a 30% default rate. So oh, wow. it's, you know, it doesn't matter to us. Yeah, there's no such thing as a bad note to me. It's just a bad price. And, uh, you know, so something that it's, uh, everything is worth something. And uh, so we underwrite very, very stringently. And, uh, and so to us, it's really not a lot different. We, we did see a step up, you know, a little bit more defaults. And we're working with our borrowers. If people can really prove that they're, they're really in distress, we'll work with them. And we just build enough margin into the models that, that it doesn't matter um, for us, you know. And, and ultimately, we're going to collect. It's just, you know, just, you know, today's cash flow may, may take a small hit, but our, our investor ROIs are just fine. Mm-hmm. And do you see any change in the next six, 12, 24 months from now? You know, the, the really good thing is, and this happened in the, in the dot-com area as well. What happens when these crises happen, it actually gets rid of the noise. And a lot of the weaker players, the, the Me Too players, you know, sorry, not, not that Me Too, the, you know, the I'm, I'm on board, you know, I'm going to jump on this bandwagon uh, players disappear. And, and so what's happening, we're, so, we've seen a lot of the smaller players step aside. A lot of, a lot of the marginal players, you know, had their capital taken away. And, and so it actually cleans the slate for us. And we, we you know, I saw in the, in the dot-com area, my, in my business, our, the largest company in the space ended up cleaning up the entire space and, and taking almost all market share for the business I was in. And so we, that's exactly what we see. This is really a time for strong players to scale. And uh, we we have a ton of interest right now in institutional capital because of our models are so robust and our track record is so good um, that are that are very excited about putting a lots more capital to work with our with our firm. So you know, there's a lot to be said about you know just your history, right? You know, dotting your eyes and crossing your T's for ten years, five and ten years, where all of a sudden people just look at you different. Like you're you're in the game to to, to stay. You do what you say. They like to work with you. You're credible. And when you when you're standing and everyone else is not, they're looking at you like, hey, what's going on? What what? Why are you standing? And tell me about your models. And so you become super attractive. And that's kind of what's happening in this time right now. So we're seeing it actually as a positive. In, uh, and with fewer players in the space, we have better buying opportunities at lower prices. We're seeing prices we haven't seen in, you know, five, five, six years and, uh, and more capital to, to play with. So mm. it could be a really good time for us. Interesting. Well, I, I want to talk about the strategy for a second. Um, I know that you're acquiring discounted mortgage notes. And I want to talk for a second about that. How do you find those notes and for how long do you hold them? Yeah, we, we hold them forever. Um, so in that, in that fund, we have two different strategies we use, but I'm talking about our income fund. We actually collect these, we buy these performing mortgages. We collect the payments from the borrowers, like you collect rent. So yeah. we, we, we hold them forever. So the really cool thing about notes, so in, this, in our fund, we have about uh, 450 loans right now. Well, 8% of them, you know, uh, liquidate every year on their own. So this is when a, a borrower refinances, right? You, when you go refinance your home, you get a new lender, that lender, all that capital goes to pay off the old lender. Well, we're the old lender, so we get paid off. And that's actually a capital gain for us because we bought them at a discount. So we get paid, you know, in our fund right now, we're, we're earning, you know, internally, you know, 12%, you know, 14% yields. But that's before we get the the capital gain. So 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 anyhow, we get those paid off. Well, we we have an investor liquidity program that allows an investor anytime to request their money back, and we've never failed in eight years to meet a to meet a liquidity request. So so bottom line is this fund is a perpetual evergreen fund that simply pays income as long as you want income. And uh, so so basically every quarter, you know, I. I, I hold whatever redemption requests I have. And if whatever I had capital had left over, I go mm-hmm. shopping with it. So we hold these forever knowing that, uh, you know, each, each a typical loan is four to six years before they're going to sell or refinance. And, um, and so, which we love, we love when they do that. 
Interesting. And, you know, when we're talking about your strategy about buying those notes, are you doing anything different in the way you buy notes today when we're basically in a global, you know, pandemic and I'm, I'm sure you're assuming a higher rate of default. What, what is, is, has your strategy changed in any ways? Not at all. It hasn't mm -hmm. changed at all. We, we have extremely rigorous underwriting and that underwriting hasn't changed. We basically, when we buy a note, we, we, we calculate, we, we figure out every possible outcome for this note. And there's about, about 12 different outcomes, depending on the note. And for each one, we model a cash flow for that outcome. And then based on our experience, we choose a probability of each outcome. And we get a, a weighted present value for anybody who's a dork like me. Um, a probabilistic, uh, you know, um, present value. Well, that becomes the cap. We don't pay more than that. So we always buy less than that. That's, that becomes the price cap we'll pay for a note. And it guarantees a return as long as we have, we, we have less than 30 or 40% defaults, which we've never come close to. So, yeah, we, we're not doing anything different. Got it. So you're basically pretty conservative and you're assuming and we worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Now, now we, we are, we are, I guess there is one change I, I think we're making and that is we're very, very careful not to buy a problem. So we want to make mm -hmm. sure when we buy a note that the payment stream is solid. So I want to make, I want to, I'm checking the last payments, you know, and making sure that up until the day we write the check for that note, that the payment stream is solid because you know, we, we know there's going to be, you know, problems. There's always a problem in a note. You know, we, that's what we, we, we buy trouble debt. So it's part of our core competency to fix that debt. And we're very good at it. Um, but we don't want to buy a problem. Okay. We want to, we out of the gate, right. We want to have it, at least it's going to start good, you know, so. Give so me an really example. Give me an example of a problem. Well, where the, there's not, they're not paying. So. I, I want to I want to verify that they've got 12 months of payments in the bag and, and including the one they paid right before I bought the note that last one that's been paid to so that's all got it. it's just making sure that it's not a you know we're not going to immediately have to go after and go go into collections for got this it note. yeah you know when when you're speaking the thought that comes to my mind is okay if if the note is performing then the bank would want to sell it the bank would want to sell it if they think that, you know, they'll have to mark it down to zero, um, the, the asset value, which means that they're not paying. So it seems like the bank is more motivated if there's a problem, but you're saying I'm not sure. selling it at a problem. So yeah. what, what basically is, is a good opportunity here that the bank doesn't want it, but you see, you know, it, it, well, you see it as a good investment. The, the bulk of our purchases are coming from hedge funds that reperform the notes. And so once they reperform the note, they're done. They, they don't mm. have a strategy to hold the notes. They have to sell it. And besides the fact that in fact, if you modify a loan, you have to, you have to uh, record it in your books at par, which means you have a phantom income. So they, for tax reasons, you have to sell this note prior to December mm. 31st uh, or whatever your fiscal year end is. And so they have to sell them um, bottom line. So, so, and what's happening now, the, buyers have disappeared. So we're one of the few buyers still in the market. So, so you have a lot more leverage when it comes to negotiating for the mm -hmm. price. It just means prices get better. You know? mm -hmm. Got, it. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So Bob, I want to talk about the process of tracking and analyzing the notes and, and looking at performance. Can you Talk to, um, can you describe the audience, the process you have in place for tracking the notes performance? Sure. And I talked about our underwriting process a little bit. That's the most important thing. You know, honestly, we really make our money when we buy. And so there's no shortcuts in underwriting. We, we're really good at that. I've spent a lot of time and energy. And, and I'm a computer scientist, so we've, we've fully automated everything and, and built built spreadsheets for everything. And I use a tool called Microsoft Power BI, Power Business Intelligence. And I encourage everyone who is, has, has ever used a spreadsheet to, to, to get this tool in addition. And it can take data from spreadsheets or databases or anything and run analytics. It's an amazing tool. And so we actually run full live performance 
from our servicer. So we actually pull the payment stream from our mortgage servicer. We pull the payment stream from our books, from our accounting package, and we literally reconcile those and we look at performance. Uh, we look at it in regions, we look at across price bands, we look across every kind of band to go see what are we doing right and what are we, do, what are we doing wrong. So, and it's, it's basically a live system. Um, so mm -hmm. there's, you know, uh, it's really gives us an edge for sure is doing these kind of analytics. Interesting. And Bob, if someone wants to start investing in notes, but they haven't done it before, and obviously right now, you know, when we have COVID, the environment is a bit different. What would you recommend those investors to do, especially now, knowing what we know that, you know, default rates are probably going to increase over time? Yeah. Um, I mean, do your homework. It's honestly, you know, uh, for performing loans, there's exchanges out, out there that have training. Um, I mean, we put a lot of our product uh, that we sell on a company called Paperstack, and uh, it's for sale there. Um, so do your homework, and they have training and educational ma materials there for people. Um, certainly, buying performing loans, you know, you want to, you want to, and non-performing loans, you want to do your homework because it is, you know, there's regulations you got to pay attention to and a few things, uh, but. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a good time and there's bad paper and there's good paper and, you know, you can pick your pain, pick your pain point. Uh, you can buy uber safe paper that, you know, your yields are going to be low, but, but it's never going to be a problem or a headache. So, so it's kind of cool. You can very much kind of pick your, your sweet spot. What do you want? How hands on do you want to be? And if they don't want to be hands-on, but they want to purchase a note, what would they do then? Well, you know, the first choice would be go to a managed fund like Aspen Funds. The second choice would be pick a uber safe note, you know, uh, that mm -hmm. you don't have to touch. So something with deep equity, something with a great pay history, <clears throat> you know, in a state that's a friendly state uh, for, you know, uh, doesn't require a lot of licensing. Got it. That, that's a uh, really good advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess the last question that I had for you, Bob, is um, if you can look into the future right now and if you can predict that, I know it's very risky to predict anything even 30 days from now, but if you could do that, what, would, what, what do you think is going to happen in the market, in the notes market um, in the next you know, six months, let's say? I think prices are going to continue to soften as as people leave leave the market you know i've actually done an economic uh forecast for the housing market that's actually i believe the housing market is going to continue strong in fact today article in the wall street journal mm -hmm. came out that is in spite of the pandemic housing prices are remaining solid and there's a reason for that that there's there's a fundamental shortage in the market a fundamental supply deficiency fundamental demand is, is there and you know and it's Debt services at an all-time low. There's a whole lot of reasons, but you know, a dozen reasons why housing is strong. So I think housing is going to continue to be fairly strong in spite of the crisis. But I think the mortgage notes are going to continue to get discounted because of the pressure on investors. So it's actually a very good time. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much for for that information. I think um, it's it's very interesting, especially for me because I've. I, I buy, you know, multifamily properties. I right. don't invest in notes. So that was really interesting for me to learn also. We've I actually bought some multifamily it. notes. <laughs> ah, there you go. So we don't have that? a lot of them. We have a few. I hope they're performing. They are. Nice. Very nice. Um, well, we have arrived to the lightning round questions. Are you ready? All right. All right. So, Bob, what's your favorite hobby? My favorite hobby is hiking in the 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado. Oh, wow. <laughs> How Although long I can't keep hike? up with my wife, but <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. Skinny little blonde woman just rips up and down these things and leaves me huffing and puffing, you know? Nice. How long does it take to get to oh the summit? Oh, my gosh. She just did an 18 mile, or I, I think I made like three miles on that one, but. You know, it's all day for sure. I've done the easiest ones, and uh, it's oh, all wow. day. Oh <laughs> Interesting and impressive. Um, <laughs> well, what's the one thing that people don't know about you? Oh, I guess you know. Uh, the, I'll, I'll say this: I was a I was a sprinter, a, a college level sprinter. Mm. 
So, Interesting. I don't, I don't have the physique anymore for that, but uh, and Nick, point, your wife is outperforming you. I know when, it's, when it's you're sad. hiking. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, what do you wish you had known when you first started investing in notes? When I first started investing in notes, um, you know, I just, I wish I'd known more about the licensing issues and the legal issues. So that was a bit of a learning curve. Got it. Mm -hmm. And um, what's your number one advice for real estate investors who want to scale their business and, or scale their note portfolio? Well, to, and really any, any business, it's, um, it's, be, it's so important just to execute, do what you say. And because, you, you know, you always will start small and your best investors is, are your current investors and they will work for others. So it's really important to get a track record to, to leverage, you know, your past into future success. So super important, do what you say and, um, and execute. And take care of all your investors. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you, Bob, where can they find you? Aspen Funds, like the tree Aspen, F U N D S dot U S, not dot com dot U S. All right, perfect. Well, Bob, thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm definitely smarter than I was probably 30 minutes ago. Uh, and I thank you for that. Pleasure to be here with you guys. Thank you so much.